Hello everybody, I am Paul Ducklin from Sophos Naked Security and my goal now is to convince you that if you have not yet upgraded to Log4J 2.17.0 or whatever the current version is at the time you see this video, you really should. So let's kick straight off. What I'm going to do, I want you to imagine that this server, although it's got my face on it, imagine this is your server. You have a service on here that accepts requests from a web server, maybe one of your web servers, that allows people to put in phone numbers. Those phone numbers are uploaded to a server running on your service and logged using Java Log4j. So here's the synthetic program that I created. Whoops, I'm in the wrong directory. So let's just get there. So let's run that up. So what I'm going to do is I am going to run a service that is listening for requests from outside. So this is you with the vulnerable server slash service. This is me, the bad guy, on a server outside that will upload a phone number to you. And somewhere inside your network, you're going to collect that number. It might be collected on a web server that doesn't use Java, that isn't vulnerable, and it's going to be passed off somewhere in your network to a server that does have a vulnerable log for j Here's what can go wrong. So just to show you what happens when I click the button, uh, I've sent the request to your server. Your server has processed it. It's received a URL, which has the phone number in it as a, as a form submission, as a GET request. It's extracted the phone number from it. And the, the synthetic logging that I'm doing here is I have called out to a vulnerable Java program and it is using the log4j process or the log4j library here. So the time that's inserted by log4j, that's the function that was called. I'm logging it as an error because they get logged by default. That's the Java class that was running. And that is the message that I wanted to log. Could be out of memory, could be network problems, or it could be data that you want to log that came in from outside. And in this case, it's exactly the data you say here, see here. So let's try that again. Let's, let's log something else. So if I don't put in a phone number, but I submit, say, hello, fire up your a server on the vulnerable computer, and you'll see once again, the server accepts the connection. The server isn't vulnerable, but it's passed off to the logger, and the logger returns the value that I put in. So that all seems pretty innocent. You're logging data from outside. That's quite normal, often for auditing or for compliance reasons. And you're logging external data now. In this case, it's a phone number. It could be an HTTP user agent string. It could be a credit card number. It could be an expiry date. It could be a name. It could be an address. Anything that you're logging that comes from outside can't be trusted. And so logging text like hello seems innocent enough. The problem is that log4j has a sort of meta language, almost a programming language of its own that allows data in or allows text in the data to be logged to control or to reprogram the logger. That sounds like a terribly bad idea, and it turns out that it is. For example, if I pretend that my phone number is Java colon, uh, let's put OS, squiggly brackets, anything inside the dollar squiggly bracket, squiggly bracket, is essentially a meta command, a program that when it's logged at the other end inside your network, the log4j code will take that string and rewrite it. So instead of logging exactly what you see there, let's look at what happens. So I'll submit that, fire up the server, and you should see that what happens in this case, what's, what gets logged is not the data that I put in there, which was actually that funny looking string. It was actually converted inside the server to a string of that sort. Now that seems perfectly innocent, it seems bad enough to me because it means that you're not logging what the user actually submitted if that was your goal, say for auditing purposes. But at least it seems innocent that you've got a dud log entry that has some weird data where the external user decided what was going to be put in your log file and you couldn't control it. Now it gets slightly worse because the programming language, if you like, that log4j supports even lets you read in-memory stuff like environment variables. So if I put in env and then I put, say, username, which is an environment variable on Windows that has the currently logged in user, you can imagine on a server that would be the account that the server's using. 
Then when that gets logged, you'll see that when the server accepts the data coming in from outside and chooses to log it, then instead of logging what you see there, env username, it's actually converted to a memory-based server string. Again, that may seem pretty innocent, but it can get even worse because, for example, if you use Amazon, Amazon Web Services, you may have an enver environment variable in your system called something like that, AWS Access Key ID. So if I'm a malevolent user and I pretend to you that my phone number is that funny string and you happen to have one of those secret access keys in memory, in the program environment on your server, in memory so that you carefully don't write it to disk, then what happens when I click OK and it reaches your computer, this is, a, this is a fake one from Amazon's website, so don't panic, is that you've now ended up logging something that was only supposed to be a memory. So that's a sort of best of the worst. But actually, there's even more that you can do with this magic programming system. If you put in a string that looks like this, dollar squiggly brackets, jindy, colon, and in this case, I'm going to follow that with LDAP, well-known directory protocol. There are lots of different protocols supported um, by this Jindy system, RMI, DNS, and others. There's a great article on Sophos News that digs into the code to analyze the bugs. If you're interested, go and have a look at that. Whoops, I want 8888, and then I'm going to put something like run there. So here's another program that I can put. So if I try and log a phone number that looks like this, believe it or not, what this instructs a vulnerable, misconfigured system to do is it says to the other end, the stuff that's in the dollar squiggly brackets, this string here that I'm choosing because I'm outside, I get to say to you, look up that server name via DNS. So no TCP connections yet. See if you can find that server by asking your corporate DNS, can you look this up? And of course, I control my dot test. So my DNS server, which we see over here, is what's going to handle that request from your corporate network to try and locate this server in the first place. And although your server may be blocked from making TCP connections, it may be allowed to do DNS lookups. So you'll see that what will happen now is that it will try and look up that server. If that server exists, it will then instruct your server, make a connection to TCP port 888 on it, Try and talk the LDAP protocol, and if you can, tell it that you're interested in a thing called run. So let's what ha look what happens when we try and submit that. Here we go. Fire up the server, accept the request. You'll see that what we should be logging is indeed that little flash. I put a little flash in my server so you can see when something interesting happens. So we didn't get much activity, it seems, and it did actually log the string that I submitted as suspicious as it is, but I from outside sending in that string did manage to force your server to do a DNS lookup via your corporate network to my DNS server. So I now know you're at least partially vulnerable because I chose that name there and I can see that echoed in my DNS data and that means I sent a request, you logged it, and while logging it you did the lookup. So that's pretty bad so far. In fact, you can see that even if nothing else happens, because there's no port 888, there's no LDAP happening, I, as the controller of this DNS server, if I wanted, imagine that instead of calling the server try me in my domain, let's say that I said, you know what, use that AWS access key, pretend that's the server name instead. And imagine that I said, well, what I want to do is I want to force you to look up a server called youraccesskey.my.test. What do you think will happen now? Well, let's have a look. When I click Submit, you'll see the request is processed. The DNS request goes out. And indeed, your server via your corporate network, by doing nothing more than a DNS lookup, has just leaked in plain text probably onto the internet and to my malevolent DNS server, I've got a copy of your uh, AWS access key ID, which is very bad indeed. But let's see if we can take it one step further. The problem here is that there's nothing running on port 8888. But of course, 
my.test, that's my domain. So I'm going to actually fire up a server here that uh, is listening on port 8888. So I'm going to run a, an LDAP server. Let's try one more time. So here we go. Now I'm going to do the access again. Let's, let's just change this string so that it's uh, obvious if we get something. Oh, I pressed enter. Never mind. Let's not do that. You'll see that now I actually did get two flashes of activity. I got the DNS lookup. There it is a second time. And then I did get the LDAP lookup because I was busily listening. And your server, your vulnerable log4j, spoke to my LDAP server. It said, hello, I'd like to log in. And of course, I'm the bad guy. I said, go on then. You don't need a password to reach my server. And in I came and you said, I want an object called run, which you see is the string I put there. So that's a second thing that I've put into your network and has leaked out again. That string matches the thing that you've looked for. And what my server's done is say, hey, by the way, I haven't got that object for you. What you need to do is go and download it via HTTP from this particular URL here, which of course I've said I want to put it on my server. So let's try again and see what happens. This time I'm going to run a web server on port 8887. So I've now got DNS should see you coming, then LDAP should capture your request for whatever it is that I want you to get, and my HTTP server should actually say, here is, and I'm, what I'm going to send you is a Java class file in the hope that you'll run it. So let's try that. Now, uh, if I just, so if I just do this exactly again, this time what I will do is I'm going to change that so we can see it more easily. That can just be, we'll call it hello this time. So let's try that again. Uh, your server's now listening. I'm going to send in the request. Remember, I'm outside. So here we go. In comes the request. Your logger processes it. You get a DNS lookup for that hello site that I wanted. You got the LDAP connection. And again, I said, please redirect. And you can see here, you obligingly redirected and my web server got your request. Now I don't have an, I don't have a, a Java class file uh, for this run object. So I just said that I was a teapot and gave you a 418 error and we didn't go any further. I've still got the data leakage here. I've still got the data leakage here, but I haven't actually injected any code. So let's try once more with this. And this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for an object via the LDAP server that I know I do have a Java program to send you. And I could send you anything. I could send you a keylogger. I could send you a network sniffer, a coin miner, you name it. What I'm going to do just to keep it simple, and because this is a demonstration, I'm going to try and pop a calculator. So I'm going to send you a Java program, which is the compile, the dot class form of this file. All it does is say, please run a calculator. I only like the best sorts of calculator, so it has to be an RPN one. I'm not going to load regular calc.exe. But if we see a calc pop up, you will know that this has been foist upon you from outside by my server over here. In other words, basically, if this works because of the vulnerable log4j, you've been pwned. And remember that I'm popping a calculator, but I'm doing it with Java code that I chose. I could put absolutely anything I want in there, ransomware, coin mining, opening back doors. In fact, one of the coin miners we've already seen the crooks using, it also opens up a root back door. It drops a, a key for the crooks and it enables root login so that if you have SSH for your own administration, they can actually log in as root to look after their coin miner and do whatever else they want. So let's see if that's going to work. So like I said, this time I'm going to be asking for a uh, something that I know I have, the run this dot class, the source code you saw. I'll put in some spaces here so we can see the, the new requests coming in if they do. Let's see what happens this time. So now I'll click OK. The server's responded. I've got the DNS request followed by the LDAP request that said where to go next. This time followed by an HTTP request that actually serves back the malicious class file. And that program did indeed pop a calculator on your server. It, this time it was only a calculator. It could, in theory, have been almost anything running on the server 
inside the Java process that's doing the logging with all the authority and network access that that Java process has. So it could download more malware if it wanted. So hopefully that convinces you you really want to do something about this. The good news is that the reason this has been working here is I have been using deliberately the old version of Log4j. So I set my Java class path. That's the environment variable that's often set that you can also set it on the command line or in a configuration file for each application will have a class file set which says, which add-ons do I want to use? So you'll typically be saying, well, I'm using log4j and a load of other stuff. And you'll say which versions you want to use. Now, it just so happens that I have uh, included here other, other, the more recent versions. So I've got 2.17 uh, of, the, of the needed files. If you have, the real distribution has lots and lots of different jar files. They'd all be in one directory. So what I'm going to do is let me just actually change my class path for the next invocation of this. And let's change that to be log4j. Let's change it to 2.17 of the API one and 2.17 of core. Those are the two components I use. More complicated logging might use more parts of the log4j toolkit. The important thing is the 2.17.0. Let us fire up that server again. And although this is a sample size of one, let's put in some spaces again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat exactly the same request. And you should see that with the patch in place, the log happens. Did you see it was much quicker? Because it didn't have to go out and try and download a load of stuff. There was no DNS lookup. There was no LDAP request. There was no HTTP download. So there was no data leaked. There was no LDAP connection and there was no malware implant. And I hope, folks, that that lets you know that really what you want is these log4j 2.17.0. If you upgraded already to 2.15.0, don't panic. There are a couple more bugs that were found in this, and 2.15 was quickly followed by 2.16, quickly followed by 2.17. If you're halfway through upgrading to 2.15, don't go back to the beginning and start again with 2.17. Finish the ones that aren't patched, then go back and upgrade the 2.15s to 2.17, because as you can see, anything you have that is below 2.15 could put you at serious risk via DNS, via a wide range of TCP protocols, including LDAP, which is the, the one that all the cool kids seem to be using, and then finally by an HTTP download that could foist any malware the crooks want. So thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. And until next time, stay secure.